Hello, uh, welcome to Math 336. This is lecture three. And today we'll be talking about the material in section uh, 1.2 on integrals as general and particular solutions. So uh, let's get started. Okay. So here we are. I'm going to try to keep my webcam on uh, this time, see how it goes. I was getting a bit of lag um, between my iPad and my computer, but uh, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. So let's do this. So, um, so yeah, so we're going to be looking at integrals as general and particular solutions. And in this section, we're only going to be considering uh, differential equations uh, of a very simple form. So these are differential equations of the form uh, dy uh, dx equals f of x. And what this means is that the, the rate of change of y does not depend on y itself. It only depends on x. So we've already seen some examples like logistic growth um, which is used to model um, contagious disease, for example, that clearly depended on um, the number, the percentage of the population that were infected. So the rate of change depends on uh, the rate of change of the percentage of people infected directly depends on the actual number of people infected, for example. So in this section, we're going to be considering uh, differential equations which are not of that form. These are ones that only depend on x. Or if these are, uh, if you're modeling something that changing with respect to time, then the rate of change only depends on time. It does not depend on the actual quantity of the thing that's changing. So these are very simple and they're a nice place to start because we already know from calculus two how to solve these types of differential equations. So let's look at our first example. Um, all right, so exam the first example is the following one. So this is clearly, uh, it's a differential equation where uh, the rate of change of y only depends on x. So how do we solve such differential equations? So, So I'm just going to switch this to blue. All right. So this, um, the way that we, we get this is, is uh, so this is uh, maybe no surprise, but in order to uh, get the solution of this differential equation, we simply integrate uh, both sides. So when we integrate dy dx, we get y of x. And then uh, we get on the right-hand side, the integral of x square root of x plus 9 dx. Okay, and I'm going to put this in here right now, uh, plus c. Okay, so this is the general solution of the differential equation. So it's the general solution. So the general solution. And what this means is that um, if we take any function which satisfies this differential equation, it must be of this form. So this gives us all possible solutions of this differential equation. So that's what we mean by the general solution of a differential equation. We could also have just a general solution of a differential equation, um, which means that it, it satisfies the differential equation for all values of the constants uh, parameter like this plus C. Um, but this is actually the general solution. So this is guaranteed, all, all possible solutions are of this form. Okay. So how do we how do we solve this? So this is calculus two, I guess calculus two, right? So how do we solve this differential equation? Well, uh, let's use uh, substitution. So to 
compute this integral, let's use substitution. And let's say u is equal to x squared plus 9. And then uh, that means that du is going to be equal to 2x dx. OK, so let's plug this stuff into this integral. And we end up getting uh, y of x is equal to, uh, so let's see. So we have, so clearly this x squared plus 9, this is going to be u. And then we also have a, an x dx. And that matches up with this guy right there. Uh, so that means actually x dx will be 1 half du. OK, so let's put that in there. So x dx will be 1 half du. So I'll just put the 1 half here. I'll put the du at the end. Then the square root x squared plus 9 is just square root of u. And then we have du. And then plus c. OK, so how do we do this integral? So this is 1 half u to the 1 half. That's what square root is. It's the same as an exponent of 1 half. So how are we going to integrate u to the 1 half? Well, we know that we're going to add 1 to the exponent and then we we just have to figure out like what what is going to go what is going to go here okay so when we add one to the exponent that will give us three halves so if i was to take the derivative of this that three halves would come down in front and it would need to cancel with whatever goes here in order for me to get exactly this when i when I'm taking the derivative, when I'm going back in this direction, I would take the derivative to go backwards. And that tells us that this coefficient should be uh, 2 thirds, so that when I multiply that by 3 halves, they will cancel each other. And I'm just going to be left with this 1 half. OK, so that's, that's a good thing to do in general whenever you're computing an antiderivative, always just Think about what happens if I take the derivative of this? Does it give me the thing that I, I want? And if, if so, then, um, then you've got the right answer. All right. OK, so let's see. So these twos cancel. So we're left with 1 third. And the u is equal to x squared plus 9. So we have this plus c. OK, so, so I wrote it as one single like chain of equalities. But if, if you like, you could also put um, y of x each time like that. So maybe you're more, more familiar with that uh, way of uh, doing a calculation with an equality. But uh, usually, I, I just write, uh, you know, I'm kind of lazy, so, you know, why keep writing that the same all the time? When I have a bunch of equalities, um, that means that whatever I started with is equal to whatever I ended up with. So that's, that's the way to uh, interpret that. Okay, so let's see. So therefore, uh, y of x is equal to one third x squared plus 9 to the 3 halves plus c is the general solution of the differential equation. So there is our general solution right there. OK, but uh, let's just look back up at the top here, you'll notice that there's this other condition here, this uh, y of minus 4 equals 0. That's our initial condition. It's a little bit of a strange initial condition, because normally you think you're starting uh, at 0. Well, I guess if 
if it's a differential equation involving time, then the most natural thing is, you know, t equals zero is the starting point. But uh, these these conditions can can start really anywhere from a mathematical point of view. It doesn't matter. So uh, here the condition is that this function has to be equal to zero when x is equal to minus four. Okay, let's uh, use that initial condition to determine the value of c that satisfies both the differential equation and this initial condition. All right, let me just move that out of the way, put it right there. All right. Um, okay, so let's let's throw this in. So now y minus four equals zero. That implies that, so I'm gonna plug in minus four where the x is. So that will give me one third minus four squared plus nine to the three halves plus c is equal to zero. All right, we're gonna solve this uh, for c. Now this uh, inside part, just simplify this a bit. Uh, minus four squared is 16 plus nine gives us 25. Um, that's really nice because we have this um, one half in the exponent. So it's gonna be, uh, we're gonna take the square root and then we're gonna cube it. That's what three halves means as an exponent. So let's take the uh, square root first and then we'll cube it. So the square root of 25 is five, and then we will cube that. So five cubed, let's see. So that's 25 times five, so that's 125. So we have 125, 125 over three, and that leads us to conclude that C is equal to negative 125 over three. Okay. So there, there I'm stringing a bunch of uh, implications. Um, so this implies this and so on. So that's, that's what I'm doing there. Kind of like what I did with the equalities above. All right. Let's, uh, let's, let's put that into our final answer. So therefore, the particular solution of the differential equation satisfying the initial condition y of minus 4 equals 0 is uh, y of x is equal to, and actually, so I have a 1 third in, um, in both the uh, first part of the function and also in this plus c. You see it's minus 125 over 3. So I'm going to factor that 1 third out just to make it look a little bit nicer. And we have x squared plus nine to the three halves. And then we have minus 125, minus 125, there we go. And that is our final answer right there. Okay, so that's a, a bit of a review of um, a u substitution to uh, compute uh, an integral and also uh, gives us an idea of uh, what it means to be a general solution and what it means to be a particular solution. So we're going to use these words a lot in this class. We're going to talk about the general solution of a differential equation where we have these uh, parameters or constants that are still there that we don't know what they are. And then we have particular solutions 
where we've used some initial conditions to determine the values of those parameters. All right, so let's, uh, let's have a look at another uh, example here. So I'm just going to move stuff down to make room. Uh, one second, I'll be, I'm just going to quickly uh, pause and uh, where is the ball? Oh yeah, there it is. Okay, I'll be right. Okay, I'm back. All right. Um, I don't think my webcam was appearing uh, at that point. I just changed the setting. We'll see if my webcam now appears in the video from now on. So let's see. Anyway, I made some room. So here we go with another example. This one is uh, also an interesting example because this will involve using uh, integration by parts in order to uh, get the solution of this differential equation. So let's uh, begin. So y of x will be the integral of x e to the x minus 1 dx plus c. Okay, so this is going to involve integration by parts. So recall that uh, integration by parts. So integration by parts, the way I remember it is, it actually comes directly from the product rule. So I've, I've never actually tried to memorize this formula because there's, there's a minus sign in there and I, I'm sure that I'm going to mess it up. I'll put the minus sign in the wrong place. It's very easy to forget this formula. So what I've done instead is I just remember that this formula comes from the product rule. So how does it come from the product rule? Well, if, if I'm taking uh, f times g and I'm taking the derivative of that, so the product rule I know quite well, uh, this is f prime g plus f g prime. So that, that I've got memorized. I'm sure I'm never gonna make a mistake with that. So how do we get integration by parts now? So I'll just subtract uh, one of these to the uh, other side. Um, I guess I'm going to, I'm going to integrate first. Yeah, so let, I'll integrate this uh, first. So that means that if I integrate both sides, I get fg is equal to the integral of f prime g plus the integral of fg prime. And then I subtract one of those over to the other side. Um, I guess it doesn't really matter which one I put over to the other side. But normally when doing integration by parts, you're thinking about taking the derivative of f. So I'll put that one on the other side. So that gives us um, the integral of f g prime is equal to f g minus the integral of f prime g. And another way that um, this is often uh, written down is the integral. So f I can think of as u and g prime is dv. So, uh, so this will be u times v. And then this integral will be um, v du. So that, that's another way to think of it as well. This is such a quick thing. I, I usually just write this down um, very quickly and I get my integration by parts formula usually up in the margin or something, I'll just quickly jot this down. So that is integration by parts. Um, so now let's use it to uh, get this, uh, to solve this, this integral up here. Um, all right, let's see. I'll just quickly make a copy of this and let's go down. Okay, so there's our integral that we're trying to use. And what's nice about integration by parts is it allows us to take part of this thing we're integrating and take the derivative of it. And that's usually to try to get rid of something. And the thing that's bothering us here is we know how to integrate e to the negative x quite easily, but there's this times x in there as well. And that times x is a real headache. So let's uh, use integration by parts so we can take the derivative of that x and it will just go away. So let's do that. So I'm going to, um, over here, just write down what I want to do. So I want, let's see, I want to take the derivative 
of that x. So that'll be the u. So the u is going to be x, and then du is going to be dx, and uh, the dv is the, uh, the rest of it. So we'll have uh, dv is equal to, um, let's move this a little bit here. Uh, dv is going to be uh, e to the negative x dx. And so that means v is whatever we get when we integrate that. And that should be um, negative e to the negative x. And just check that quickly. If you were to take the derivative of negative e to the negative x, we're going to get e to the negative x because there's a chain rule in there. So when you take the derivative, you'll end up multiplying by the derivative of minus x, which is minus 1 and that will cancel that minus sign. All right, so there is uh, what we're gonna do for the uh, integration by parts. So now let's put this all together. So the first thing is going to be u times v. So that's x times uh, negative e to the negative x. And then we'll have a minus integral of v du. So that will be negative e to the negative x and du is dx. And then there's a plus c. Don't forget the plus c. OK. This will be negative x e to the negative x. And this will be plus integral of e to the negative x dx plus c. Right, that does not change. Let's in integrate this. Um, we actually just integrated it up there, so we know what it is. It's negative e to the negative x, um, and then plus c. And let's, um, there's two common terms there. Let's put them together. So it'll be negative x. So I'm factoring out the negative 1. And then I'm also factoring out this um, e to the negative x. And that gives us our uh, general solution. So there's our general solution. We have our general solution right there. So that looks great. And now let's uh, determine the particular solution which satisfies that initial condition. Uh, what is the initial condition? It is way up here. Oh no, that's not, that's not the one I wanted. Where did my initial condition go? There it is, right there. So that is uh, y of 0 equals 1. Okay, y of 0 equals 1. So y of 0 equals 1. This implies that, um, so, so this thing, this thing here is, this is, this is y of x. Um, so I'm just going to substitute 0 in for x. So I get 0 plus 1, e to the negative 0 plus c, and that's equal to 1. And when we simplify, we're going to get minus 1 times e to the 0, which is also 1. So that's going to be minus 1. And therefore, c is equal to 2. And therefore, y of x equals negative x plus 1, e to the negative x plus 2, is the particular solution of the differential equation that satisfies the initial condition Um, that satisfies the initial condition. Okay, so I'll just I'll just say that's perfect. So that says that satisfies the initial condition. All right. So there we go. Um, there's a couple of examples that we just did. So we did uh, one that required uh, u sub, and then we did another one which required uh, integration by parts. So these, yeah, as you can see, these these types of um, these types of 
uh, integrals, or these types of differential equations are very easy uh, to solve. So we can just write down here, So and, uh, in, um, if you have a differential equation like this, the, the general solution is given by y of x equals integral of f of x dx plus c. And then, of course, the particular solution, um, you need some initial condition to determine C. All right. OK, so, so next. Um, I'm going to move this right up here. No, I won't. No, I won't. I'm going to leave it right there. I'll just leave it right there. So, okay. So next. So what, you know, so what, what's, what's a nice example of uh, differential equations that only depend on um, the independent variable, what, such as time, but don't depend on anything else. Uh, so a really good example of this is dealing with problems of velocity and acceleration. Well, I, I mean, I have to say in particular, um, when dealing with uh, velocity and acceleration where there's no uh, friction or air resistance. So one, uh, we'll see later on actually, once there's friction or air resistance, this actually does depend on not just time, but it also depends on the actual uh, velocity, right? The, the faster you're going uh, through the air, the more air resistance you're um, experiencing. So obviously air resistance is a function of how fast you're going. So that's not this type. But if we uh, ignore air resistance right now, imagine we're living in a vacuum, then um, this uh, velocity and acceleration problems will definitely uh, satisfy the, it, it has the same form that we're interested in. Okay, so uh, just to remind you, uh, gravitational acceleration, which we call g uh, at the surface of the earth is uh, approximately 32 feet per second squared or approximately 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay, so, um, We're going to let y of t uh, be the, the height of an object at time t. And we're going to let v of t be its velocity at time t. And a of t is the acceleration of uh, the object at time t. So as you've uh, probably seen before, we know that uh, v of t is the derivative of y of t and a of t is the derivative of v of t. So that means actually a of t is the second derivative of y of t. Um, so assuming no air resistance, uh, a of t will be given by minus g. And if we integrate that and then add the constant, we're going to get v of t is minus g times t plus v naught. And v naught is our uh, initial velocity. So that'll be our initial velocity, which makes sense if you plug in uh, zero here. So this term will go away and you'll just get V of zero equals V naught. Oops. All right. And if we integrate that again, we're going to get Y of T is equal to minus a half G T squared plus V naught T plus, and now we have another uh, constant from our integration. And that is actually the initial height. And again, you can see it's initial height because um, if I plug in zero here, so what is the height at time zero? Uh, plug in zero here, zero here. So all of this stuff goes away and we're just left with y of zero equals y naught. Okay. All right. 
Um, so let's look, let's look at an example of uh, this type of, of velocity and acceleration problem. So uh, in uh, number 27 from the exercises, we have a ball that is thrown straight downward. So someone just chucks it down like that from the top of a tall building. And the initial speed that they're uh, throwing it down at, uh, just as it sort of, I guess, passes the top of the building. So maybe you've got some sensor which is measuring how fast this ball is going right at the moment that it's uh, crossing the roof line. Um, so at that moment, they measure it, it's 10 meters per second going down and it strikes the ground uh, at a speed of uh, 60 meters per second. So again, they've got another uh, device at the bottom that's measuring the velocity at the moment that the ball hits the ground and we can use this information to de actually determine how tall the building is. Um, assuming that air resistance is not a huge factor in the, the motion of this ball as it goes down. So it's nice and round, it just falls straight through the air without uh, experiencing a lot of air resistance. It's a very big assumption, but um, for the sake of this exercise, let's make that assumption. And let's go ahead and start working on this problem. Okay, so let's see, the initial speed of the ball is 10 meters per second. All right, well, so okay, so first of all, we know that it's falling and we're going to assume there's not really any air resistance. So that means that uh, A of T is minus, oh, and, and notice we're dealing with meters per second. So that means we'll have to use the uh, 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay, if we integrate that, we'll get V of T is minus 9.8 T plus V naught. Oh, we know V naught. So V naught is minus 10 meters per second. Remember it's going down, right? So it's gonna be minus 10 meters per second. Um, so every second it's losing um, you know, instantaneously, it's, it's uh, every second, it's approximately losing um, 10 meters uh, per second. So, and it's taking that from the, the height. So that's why it's minus. So if the height is 400, then a meter later, it'll be um, 390, right? So minus, minus, definitely minus. So it'll be plus V naught. Um, okay, so let's say plus V naught. And then we know that V naught is, uh, is equal to 10 meters, minus 10 meters per second. So we'll get, um, uh, let, me, let me just put it down. It's getting a little too crowded here. So that'll be equal to minus 9.8 T minus 10, and that is meters per second. Okay, so that's our formula for V of T. And now we can also look at uh, y of t, and this will be, um, so it's gonna be one half times g, um, or negative one half times g. So that'll be, um, well, I'll just write it, I'll just write it. So 9.8 divided by two t squared minus 10 t plus y naught. Oh, okay. So, the question that we're trying to answer is, what is why not? So what was the height of the ball as it uh, started falling uh, or when it was going uh, minus 10 meters per second at the uh, roof line of the building? Okay, so that's the thing that we want to answer. And let's see if we've got enough information here. Um, let's see. What do we need? Oh, okay, I think I see. Oh yeah, right. So we know that when the ball is hitting the ground, it's going minus 60 meters per second, right? That's what it's set up here. So it hits the speed, it hits the ground at the speed of 60 meters per second. Okay, so um, let's say um, the time, uh, 
So let's let's call it. So I'm going to call t hat is equal to the time a ball hits the ground. So that'll be the time the ball hits the ground. And v of t hat is equal to minus 60 meters per second. OK. I think that lets us solve for t hat. Yeah. Yeah, let, let's, yeah, I think this lets us solve for t hat. So let's plug that in. So v of t hat will be minus 9.8 t hat minus 10, and that's equal to minus 60. Yeah, I can solve this for t hat. I can solve this for t hat. This will be t hat uh, is equal to, let's see, I'll add 10 to both sides. So it'll be minus 50, and then I'll divide by 9.8, minus 9.8. Right, right. That's what it gives us right there. Uh, I'm going to cancel those minus signs. And then I will multiply top and bottom by 10. I just want to make this like a nice fraction. So I'll multiply top and bottom by uh, 10. So that gives me 500 over 98. And that simplifies down to 250 over 49. Yeah, 49. And 7 does not divide into 250. So that's the simplest uh, fraction. And that's equal to something, but I, I don't really care exactly uh, what, I mean, maybe, maybe I do care. So what, what, is, it, what is that exactly? Um, so 250 divided by 49. So that's about 5.1. So that'd be about 5.1 seconds. Okay, so that, that is useful. So that's approximate, or, well, I'll just say it's equal to like five, five point one. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll just say approximate. That's approximate. Approximately 5.1 seconds. But I'm not going to use that 5.1 in the rest of the calculation, because if I round that number now, it's going to make uh, my future calculations will not be as accurate. So I want to be as accurate as I can. So I'm going to keep this at 250 over 49. And just you can just remember that that means that the ball was falling for about five seconds. So. Okay, now let's see, what do we wanna do? Right, we wanna find y naught. Oh, okay, 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 I think I see. So what else do we know about this t hat? Well, y of t hat, that's when the ball hits the ground, right? So what is the height when the ball hits the ground? Zero, it's zero, right? So that gives us another equation. So let's, uh, let's use that equation now and see what we get. So y of t uh, equals zero. Um, I'll just I'll just move this over here. Y of t equals zero. So what does that imply? Um, uh, let me simplify that. So that'll be minus uh, four point nine. So minus four point nine t hat squared minus 10 t hat plus y naught is equal to zero. Right, 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 right. Yeah, that's it. Okay, so now let me plug in that, uh, that 250 over 49. So what do we get? We get y naught is equal to 4.9 times um, that 250 over 49 squared plus 10 times 250 over 49. And I'm kind of running out of room here. So let me just make a little bit more space. Um, I'll be right back. OK, so here we are. And let's let's calculate this. Um, I'm just gonna see exact what is this exactly. So that's gonna be like 49 over 10 times 250 over 49 and that's squared. I'm just typing into. Um, and I, I'm actually, I'm using a programming language called Julia on my computer. So I've got this Julia prompt. I'm just typing this in. And that gives me, okay, that gives me, 
um, the following. So there, therefore, uh, y naught is equal to, uh, so it, it's exactly 1250 over seven. So I, that's exactly what it is. But what is, what is that approximately? So 1250 over seven. All right, so that is approximately, if I round that to two decimals, I get 178.57 and the next digit is one. So I'm just, that's, I'm, it's, I'm just gonna stop there. That's perfect. So it's gonna be approximately 178.57 meters, right? We're, we're using meters here. Okay, so that's our answer. So therefore the building is approximately um, 178.57 meters uh, tall. So that is our final answer right there. Okay, so there's, there's a good example of um, how we can use uh, differential equations. I mean, it's, it's very simple. It's actually just um, basic calculus, I guess, that we're using here. But uh, it does illustrate the, the idea very, very nice of uh, general solutions of differential equations and particular solutions of differential equations. Okay, let's do, let's do another example. So last example, here we are. Last example. So in this example, um, we have the, the skid marks uh, made by an automobile indicate that its brakes were fully applied for a distance of 75 meters before it came to a stop. Okay. So it left a skid of 75 meters. Okay, we'll have to keep, well, we'll draw like a little picture in a second, but we know that the car is stopping. Uh, it, it just slammed on the brakes and it skidded for 75 meters, which is, I would say that's a lot, right? That, that's a very long time, a long distance in order uh, to stop a car. So I'm imagining this car was probably going uh, pretty fast. So we'll, we'll, see, we'll see how fast the car was actually going in a sec at the end of the question. Um, so we know, we know a little bit about this car. It says this car uh, is known to have a constant deceleration of 20 meters per second squared under the current condition. So like under the, whatever the road condition was um, when this happened. So we know that um, from other uh, experiments, we know that the, it experiences a constant deceleration of about 20, of, of 20 meters per second squared. So then how fast in kilometers per hour was the car traveling when the brakes were first applied? All right, so that, that's all we're given. We're given the 75 meters to stop and we know that the um, deceleration is 20 meters per second squared. And that should be enough to determine um, how fast the car was going at the, at the beginning. All right, let, let's just draw a little picture because I'm having a little bit of trouble um, visualizing this it's nice to visualize it okay so let's say let's say this is the moment here where the um where the brakes uh where they slammed on the brakes and down here and we'll call this zero so that's that's zero that's that's when it hit the brakes down here at 75 that's when the car came to a stop so here's car came to a stop uh, 75, min, uh, 75 meters and this whole time here this is the skid so it, it's it, it was skidding that entire time before it came to a stop all right and what else do we know um, I guess we know that it was decelerating at 20 meters per second squared during that time okay so we have constant deceleration of 20 meters per second squared. So that means the acceleration is negative 20 meters per second squared. And the velocity, 
will be negative 20 t plus the initial velocity. OK, what is the initial? Oh, yeah, that's the thing we want to find out. So the initial velocity uh, is, is what, right? So that's the big question. OK, uh, let's integrate that again. We'll call it x instead of y. y is usually used for like vertical uh, height, and x is used for like horizontal distance. So let's use x in this case. But the, the principle is the same. We integrate, we get negative 10 t squared plus v naught t plus, uh, oh, x naught, I guess we'll call it x naught, right? x naught. Oh, x naught, okay, so x naught is, is when, yeah, so this is going to be uh, t equals zero at that time, right? And then this will be, at this time, it'll be t equals, I don't know, I guess we don't know how long it took, so let's call it t hat. So it stops at some time in the future, uh, which will be t hat, and I'm, I'm guessing we'll be able to figure out what t hat is as well. Um, but x naught, okay, let's see, x naught, so x naught, oh yeah, so this is going to be x naught right here, right? So that's zero. And then this will be x of t hat, right? That's the distance uh, it was uh, when it's uh, stopped uh, after t hat time. T, I guess t, it's going to be t hat seconds. So whatever we get, it'll be in seconds. So t hat seconds. Okay, um, what else do we know? Oh, uh, we know something else over here as well. What is the velocity of the car when it stopped? Okay, well, that's a pretty easy question to answer. So that's going to be obviously zero, right? It stopped, so it's not moving. So the velocity is zero. Okay, now this is, this is great because we can start using some of this in order to figure out some of these uh, uh, quantities. Um, let's start with the v of t naught equal uh, v of uh, t hat equals zero. So that means that negative twenty t hat plus v naught that equals zero. Oh, okay, great. So now we know v naught is equal to twenty t hat. Okay, okay. So once we know what t hat is, we know what v naught is. That's perfect. That's perfect. All right, now, um, what's the other thing? Oh yeah, x of t equals 75, okay. So x of t, let's see, x of t hat equals 75. All right, so negative 10, t hat squared, and we know v naught is 20 t hat. So that would be plus 20 t hat squared plus x, oh, x naught. Oh yeah, yeah, x naught is zero. So that, that's, that's zero. Let me just make a note of that here. So this guy, that is zero, right? That's zero. So that's just gonna go away. All right, perfect. So we get this, and that will be equal to 75. OK, OK. Now I think we can solve for t hat, right? So this is going to be 10 t hat squared equals 75. That means that t hat squared is going to be um, uh, let's see. So, well, it'll be 75 over 10, and uh, you can divide 5 in there. Um, so it'll be 15 over 2, right? Yeah, 15 over 2. All right, and then take the square root. So, I mean, there, there's two, there could be plus or minus, but obviously time is not negative. Um, so, we're going to have just the positive square root. So that'll be square root of 15 over two. Okay, so that's the time. Uh, actually, I'm very curious. Let's just see, what is that exactly? If I plug that into my trusty calculator, also known as my, as Julia running on my computer, and I get 
Um, let's see. So that's, well, that's going to be approximately, um, well, let's just, so 2.738 six seconds all right it's, pro it's probably overly precise um but that was uh so anyway so it, about 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 2.7 seconds two point maybe well let, let's just let's because we don't really care about those other digits so let's just say it's about 2.4 seconds uh, 2.74 seconds yeah okay well that seems like a short time, but I think that's probably in terms of like stopping a car, that's that's actually a pretty long time. So you taking 2.74 seconds to stop a car, um, pretty, pretty, pretty frightening. Okay, let's, uh, let's now plug that guy in. Oh yeah, we know, now we can figure out what T naught, uh, what V naught is. Um, so therefore, remember V naught is just 20, T hat, right? 20, yeah, 20 T hat. So let's multiply 20 uh, times square root of 15 over two. I guess we should probably rationalize the, den the denominator and it'll make things a little bit nicer. So we'll end up getting uh, square root of two times square root of two. That's, that's just two. So 20 divided by two is 10. And then square root 15 times square root two is square root of 30. All right, all right. And um, so that, that means that uh, V naught is approximately um, 10 times square root of 30. All right, so it'll be approximately uh, 54 point seven seven uh what is that meters per second oh okay but so we're not done yet because the question wanted us to answer how fast was the car moving in kilometers per hour so we just take that quantity we um we divide by a thousand so that'll give us kilometers per second and then we multiply by uh, 3,600, and that will give us kilometers per hour. Right, exactly, okay. So, um, so we'll get that um, V naught is equal to 10 root 30 um, divided by thousand and multiplied by well let, let me just let me just write it over here so it'll be um, multiplied by 3600 seconds per hour and divided by a thousand meters per kilometer and now we've got that in kilometers per hour and what is that what is that so according to my calculator my computer i've got 197 point eight one kilometers per hour holy smokes that is super fast that is super fast i don't think i've ever been in a car going that that is insanely fast so this car was going insanely fast and it slammed on the brakes and about 2.74 seconds later it came to a stop but it took 75 meters to come to that, so that's a huge distance to come to a stop. So um, this sounds like a very reckless driver to me, or maybe they're driving on like a, a racing track, and you know, that that's probably that's probably fine then. But still, not not a fun thing to decelerate twenty um, meters per second for sure. All right, so I think that brings us to the end of our uh, lecture today. So that's all I wanted to talk about in this section on um integrals as general and particular solutions oh i can see a huge amount of lag in uh in that video so um oh well um hopefully uh, the lag isn't too bad 
I'll, maybe I'll, I'll keep trying to use the webcam. Uh, I think it's nice. Um, anyway, let me know what you think. Yeah, webcam plus lag or no lag and no webcam. Um, that's the deal. All right, so thanks, thanks so much for uh, watching this. And I will be posting these notes on Blackboard after I just kind of remove some of the extra white space in these notes. And I'll post them up and uh, have a look at them and let me know if you have any questions. Thank you so much. And bye. Bye for now.